Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, Pope Francis prays at a cemetery dedicated to unborn children. Abortion advocates argue abortion restrictions hurt kids. And this. The reason I'm here today is that even in his final days, JJ was adamantly opposed to assisted suicide. A young widow is on a mission to speak out against physician-assisted suicide in honor of her late husband. But first, our top story, pro-lifers gained key seats in the Senate while losing control of the House of Representatives in the 2018 midterm elections. Republican Marsha Blackburn, who chaired the House panel investigating Planned Parenthood's trafficking of baby body parts, won a decisive victory in Tennessee as the state's first female senator. Also notable for the pro-life movement, Democrat Senators Heidi Heitkamp of North Dakota, Joe Donnelly of Indiana, and Claire McCaskill of Missouri all lost their re-election bids. The three senators all identify as Catholic, but voted in favor of abortion on key votes. Meanwhile, in the House, Democrats won 219 seats, taking back control for the first time in six years. To break down what the midterm results mean for the pro-life movement, we're joined by Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List. She also spearheaded the pro-life coalition for then-candidate Donald Trump in 2016. And John Braybender is here. He's the chief strategist and creative officer at Braybender Cox. He's a political consultant who's consulted both Senator Rick Santorum and Vice President Mike Pence, among others. Thank you both for being here. Let's get straight to it. Was this midterm election a win or loss for the pro-life movement? Well, I think it was a tremendous win. I'm going to jump in front of John. Go right in. I think it was a tremendous win. Um, I wouldn't necessarily cut it up as um, for pro-life as I would Republican. For pro-life, um, we went from a 49-seat um, minority in the Senate to a 51-seat majority. So we're in very good shape. We've got a, a good margin. Um, I think, and, and our strategy in the pro-life movement has been very important, and that is to make sure that we have the, the, the um, senators that will confirm circuit court and Supreme Court nominees. We're in a very, very good position. We had ballot initiatives all over the country, great new governors. A good day, not so much in the House, but a good day. But, but I agree with you. If there's protections we need in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the pro-life movement, it's, it's really going to happen more in the Senate than it's going to happen in the mm -hmm. House, particularly because of judicial nominees and so forth. I mean, quite frankly, everybody wants to look at grading the president and things mm -hmm. like that. Two Supreme Court justices that we know believe in the sanctity of life is a big deal. Yeah. And, you know, other judicial nominees that are out there that have not been confirmed mm -hmm. yet that feel the same way is a big deal. And the big question is the divided Congress with pro-lifers no longer in control of the House. What does that mean in pushing forward with President Trump's pro-life agenda? Mark Irons, the White House correspondent for EWTN News Nightly with Lauren Ashburn, asked the president that very question. How are you going to push forward your pro-life agenda? Just going to push. I've been pushing. I've done a very good job, too. We're very happy with me. But it's a tough issue for the two sides. There's no question about it. But what are you going to do? There is great debate. What am I going to do? I, I won't be able to explain that to you because it is an issue that is a very... Uh, a divisive, polarizing issue. But there is a solution. I think I have that solution, and nobody else does. What? We're going to be we're going to be working on that. How will the president push forward on his pro-life agenda? I mean, I think he'll do exactly what he has been doing, uh, making him the most pro-life president we have ever had. He'll push administratively. He'll do the most important thing, which is to continue to nominate judges that will do the right thing when it comes to this issue. I don't have any question that he's right, that he's the guy that knows what to do. He knows very well. Um, I, I'm not concerned at all. The fact that there's a bottleneck in the in the House, or the, now that there the, that actually there's a there's a plug in the House in terms of getting legislation done. Um, yes, it's disappointing. There'll be a contrast in this country. We'll see what. The Nancy Pelosi uh, contrast will look like as we move into the presidential election again. I'm not worried that the president will falter in any way. No, and, and, and interesting enough, I think mm -hmm. early in the 2016 campaign, mm -hmm. there was some concerns how pro-life of a president is would Donald Trump be. Mm -hmm. He has certainly put all those to rest, certainly with his nominees, certainly picking a Mike Pence as his running mate, yes. uh, you know, those type of things, and legislation that he's worked on. Legislation. What I liked is the idea is that he didn't say, okay, we're going to have a more moderate 
Democrat-controlled House, mm -hmm. and we're going to run away from this issue. Mm -hmm. He said, I have a plan, and we're going to get it done. And I think that's mm -hmm. good to hear. John is absolutely right. And what he did from when he um, was, even in his primaries until now, was help lead that move of the pro-life movement from defense to offense, never relenting, always being courageous about pinning the label on the actual extremists every single time. And that has been a revolution for the pro-life movement. Well, well, our eyes are watching to see if we can get those pro-life promises accomplished. And we've been talking a lot, even in this discussion, about judges and the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So what do these key gains in the Senate mean for the Supreme Court and potential nominees? Well, certainly they mean if we get another chance at it, which would be the third under Donald Trump's presidency, mm -hmm. it's going to be a little smoother, I believe, than the last mm -hmm. one. We have more votes that are going to mm -hmm. be supportive. And so uh, I sure hope we do get that chance, because if you really want to change and have the sanctity of life preserved, freedom of religion preserved. The Supreme Court's ultimately going to be the final say in that, and having the right justices that understand that I think are important. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll get another opportunity, at least one more, um, which means that the court will, the, the balance will tip even further in what we believe is a more reasonable uh, mm -hmm. pro-life direction. All those circuit courts, however, that bolster, that are the courts um, the, of first resort for all the legislation coming up, those are also a little bit hidden but vital and uh, arguably of equal impact given that you can't get to the Supreme Court without going through a circuit court. Also very notable for the pro-life movement, we saw Senators Donnelly, Heitkamp, and McCaskill all lose. Those three identify as Catholic but have voted in favor of abortion on key votes. What do their losses say? What message does that send? Well, first of all, I think part of it, and I, I was involved in the Indiana Senate race, and so I was watching the polling numbers. Believe me, the whole race changed after the Kavanaugh confirmation mm -hmm. hearing. And I think that there were a lot of Americans who saw that this was not about issues or ideology. This was simply about politics. Mm -hmm. And I think they were turned off by that. And I think, you know, what happened to Joe Donnelly was not only did he vote the wrong way, but people did not like the process they saw coming out of out of the left in those hearings. Yeah, I would add that um, each of those that you named, in addition to a few others, mm -hmm. were our people visited 2.7 million homes communicating the pro-life message. Mm -hmm. And here's what the message was. Your sitting senator acts like he's pro-life. He's kind of pro-lifey, but he doesn't vote that way. Mm -hmm. And that is a message that is now heard that really wasn't heard in the politics of the pro-life movement of the past. And it is really providing a winning margin, emboldening pro-life um, elected officials to really go ahead and accept that mandate and go ahead and legislate and do the right thing and vote for the right judges and right now. Voters were watching their actions That's right. on this. Marjorie, there were also three very important pro-life initiatives on the state ballots. How mm -hmm. did they do? They won. Uh, thanks be to God. Uh, in West Virginia, uh, an amendment passed to make sure that taxpayer funding didn't go towards the Medicaid, abortions in Medicaid. And in Alabama, they changed the Constitution so that when they start passing pro-life protections, as we erode and hopefully one day overturn Roe, mm -hmm. that those will be upheld. And so we're all set to go. So wins in West Virginia and in Alabama. Yes. Finally, now that the midterm elections are over and we are already have our eyes on 2020, what are the key lessons the pro-life movement should take away and moving forward? Well, I think what's going to be interesting to watch is the primary for the Democrat nomination mm -hmm. for president yeah. because mm -hmm. you are going to see progressive one-upmanship. Everybody in that is going to play to the left side of the party. They're going to try to move there and they're going to try to out-liberal everybody else at the debates. And so mm -hmm. you are going to see uh, candidates that are unlike the fabric of this country. Yeah, and, and John, I also think there's going to be an, there's going to be a, a uh, under the radar argument among them. They're going to try to keep it under the radar. Uh, how about how do we actually gain some of these states that are very red, very pro-life? Um, are we going to do what Nancy Pelosi said and allow people to um, to be pro-life? Are we going to let people mm -hmm. do that in the Democratic Party? It is a wedge right now that has basically um, been to the advantage of pro-life candidates and the Republican Party. Are they going to allow any of that? No, I'm going to guess no. They're going to want to seem like they are without actually doing it. But that's when we take advantage of that moment and really pin them down on exactly what they will do. I cannot believe we're already talking about 2020, but that's the, <laughs> that's the reality. John Bray Bender, Marjorie Dannenfelser, thank you both for being here this important week. Thank you. Thank you. The midterm elections are now over, but our work isn't done. Regardless of where your representative or senators stand on the issue of abortion, 
it's crucial they know you are pro-life and you vote. Which brings us to this week's call to action. Tell Congress to vote pro-life as members begin their new term. Here's all you have to do. Go to your computer or smartphone and type in prolifeweekly.com. Once you get to prolifeweekly.com, just fill in your basic information so we can identify your members of Congress. When you click to submit your message, it will tell your state's representatives and senators they need to vote pro-life. We made great pro-life gains in the Senate, but we are expecting pro-life legislation to come under fire in the House of Representatives. Make sure your members of Congress know where you stand and that you vote accordingly. We still have much to do to protect those at risk of the violence of abortion, and our political engagement doesn't end on Election Day. Let's send a strong pro-life message to lawmakers that the pro-life movement is paying close attention to their records. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell them to vote pro-life. We go now to pro-life headlines from around the globe. Pope Francis visited a cemetery for unborn children on All Souls Day. The Vatican said the Holy Father prayed for the children and left bouquets of white flowers on their tombs prior to celebrating Mass. During his homily, Pope Francis called All Souls Day a day of hope and a reminder that the love of the Father awaits us in heaven. Meanwhile, Italy considers granting farmland to encourage bigger families. The Italian government is weighing a proposal that would grant state-owned farmland to married couples who have a third child between 2019 and 2021. Families would be able to keep the farmland for 20 years. The proposal has been billed as an effort to combat Italy's plunging birth rate, the lowest in Europe. And New Zealand moves to decriminalize abortion. New Zealand currently considers abortion a crime, permitting it only in limited circumstances. A law review in the country suggested three alternative pieces of legislation that would permit abortion in more cases. For our next segment, we share the story of a family who chose hope over despair. He only has about four weeks left to live. Yeah. And that was a week ago. The end of September, he got depressed and there was no hope at this point. I was done. Done. But now, we're gonna keep going. This is a video from Marine Corps combat veteran J.J. Hansen's final days. Hansen was also a husband and father of two who died last December from an aggressive brain tumor. When he was given a four-month prognosis to live, Hansen refused physician-assisted suicide and outlived his prognosis by three years. Before his death, J.J. Hansen became a face against assisted suicide, and today his legacy lives on through his family. I sit down with JJ's widow, Kristen Hansen, as she bravely opens up about their family's journey. Kristen Hansen, thanks so much for taking time to be with us today. Thank you for having me, Catherine. It is our honor to have you, and we're here to speak about your husband, JJ. Tell us about JJ. JJ was such an incredible person. He was um, a Marine Corps war veteran. He uh, served in New York under two uh, Democratic governors, and he was a volunteer fireman. He, um, he was the love of my life and my best friend. He's the father of my, my two sons. Can you tell us about when he was diagnosed with brain cancer and a little bit about that journey? So JJ and I, we, were, we had just moved down to Florida. He, he was 33 years old, healthy. We had no idea that anything was wrong. We had just had our son James. He was one year old um, at the time. And JJ went to work like any other normal day. And by the afternoon, I received a phone call saying that he had had a seizure and he was in the hospital and I needed to get there as quickly as I could. We, it was, it was a shock. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know what to expect. And what was his diagnosis at that time? So when I got to the hospital, they, they actually had run some scans. They did a CAT scan. They ran blood work. They thought he was okay. They told me that he would probably go home by the evening. And something just told me that there was something they were missing. Mm -hmm. And we 
we finally were able to get them to do an MRI, and the MRI revealed that there were two lesions on his brain. They ended up doing a biopsy, and the biopsy showed that he had brain cancer. It took two more weeks to find out through the pathology that it was glioblastoma multiform, the most aggressive form of brain cancer that there is. He was given just a few months to live. The neurosurgeon who per performed the biopsy said that it was inoperable because it was located right on his speech center. So if we were to do surgery, the risk was too great that he would lose all ability to speak and understand language. And so because of that, they said four months left to live, um, if we were lucky, perhaps a year. And yet he lived three and a half years beyond that, isn't that right? It is, yeah. Um, I remember the moment where the doctor told me that because of the cancer it was four months, if it had been a less aggressive cancer, brain cancer, maybe three years. And I remember in that moment everything stopped and I just, all I could think of what was why. Why just four months? Mm -hmm. I would give anything for three years. And thankfully we didn't listen to that first neurosurgeon and we went and got second and third opinions and found a neurosurgeon who removed the tumors. JJ did standard and experimental treatment and he ended up living three and a half years. Incredible. And in those three and a half years you and JJ decided to be a witness against assisted suicide. Can you tell us about why you two made that decision to fight this battle? You know, this wasn't an issue that JJ or myself would have been involved in before that. Um, talking about death is not easy, and most of us, our initial reaction is we, d we don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And assisted suicide is very sensitive because the way it's portrayed in the media is that this is someone's personal choice. Mm -hmm. Who are you to question that and try to take that choice away from them? And it's, it's very easy to be fearful of that and not want to talk about it. But going through what we went through, it was um, about five months into JJ's diagnosis after a short period of a few weeks where he was not doing well. Physically, emotionally, the treatments were taking a toll on him. He had become very depressed. Um, we didn't know it at the time. We were there with him, loving him, supporting him, but it wasn't until later he shared that he had some very dark days where he questioned everything. He, he wondered, is this worth it? If, if I'm gonna die anyway, why am I fighting? Am I too much of a burden to all of you? He, he felt like it was a burden for us to care for him, even though we didn't feel that way, of course. Um, and it was after that, shortly after that, when we saw Brittany Maynard on, on TV. Right. And we saw how assisted suicide was being portrayed. It was this message of hopelessness that n no matter what you do, the, you, this is the compassionate and dignified way of dying. And if you're a patient like JJ, he had the exact same cancer as Brittany. Um, there was no hope of living. The, and, mm -hmm. and at that point, JJ was going into remission and he was responding to the treatment. So we were just shocked. We, we were fearful for all the other patients who would see that, hear that message, and give up hope. And we knew, going through it, that the most important thing a patient or their caregivers could have is hope. Even if it's just hope for that day, you know, hope is so important to all of us. We'll be back with the rest of our interview with Kristen Hansen as she opens up about what those final years with JJ were like. EWTN Pro Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A recent article in the Los Angeles Times claimed restricting abortion hurts not just women, but children as well. That's this week's Speak Out segment. The recent article was titled, When a Woman Wants an Abortion But Can't Get It, The Children She Already Has Suffer the Consequences. It was based on what's been dubbed the Turnaway Study, in which the authors spoke to women who were not permitted to undergo abortion procedures because they were too far along in their pregnancy and it exceeded the legal gestational limitations in their state. The study's authors compared them to women who had abortions earlier in the pregnancies. 
both groups of women in the study had children prior to seeking or having an abortion. The study's authors claimed that children of women who were not legally permitted to have an abortion were less likely to reach developmental milestones than whose mothers did have an abortion, although there was little statistical difference between the two groups. It's clear this study is intended to introduce a new pro-abortion talking point, that denying women abortion hurts the children they already have. This new talking point is indicative of the mental gymnastics required to defend the evil act of abortion. An imagined risk to children who have already been born is no justification for ending the life of a child yet to be born. It is, of course, the violence of abortion that harms women and takes the lives of their children. And unborn victims of abortion, of course, won't reach any of those developmental milestones. Here at EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, we will continue to push back on new abortion claims such as this one and defend the inherent dignity of both women and the unborn. And remember, there is always something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell your members of Congress to vote pro-life. We continue on now to the rest of our interview with Kristen Hansen. Hansen is the widow of the late J.J. Hansen, a Marine Corps combat veteran who rejected physician-assisted suicide and died naturally from his aggressive brain tumor. He outlived his four-month prognosis by three years before dying in December of 2017. Kristen Hansen opens up about the value in their final days together. As a caregiver, as someone who loved and cared for someone who was dying from cancer, can you share with us what those last years meant to you? Oh my goodness. I am so thankful for each and every day that we had. Mm -hmm. JJ's motto became every day is a gift. Mm -hmm. And that was so true. Each and every day we had together was, was something I treasure now. We were able to make so many memories with James, our older son. Mm -hmm. He got to know who his daddy is. We made videos, we took pictures, we spent time together. And that's the most important thing any of us can have is time. But we were also very fortunate to have our other son, or our younger son, Lucas. He was an unexpected gift in the journey and James is just such a doting, loving older brother. And every time I look at them together, it's, it gives me hope. What a gift. And yet we are seeing this propaganda and this messaging that physician-assisted suicide is some form of a medical treatment. Uh, is that dangerous? Oh my goodness, it's so dangerous. And ultimately that is why we decided to become involved because JJ having worked in politics and mm. in state government, mm. he saw that people weren't being made aware of the very real dangers of when assisted suicide becomes public policy. You may in theory agree with this idea of personal autonomy and choice that if this decision truly does not impact others, they should have the right to do that. But he mm -hmm. saw that in reality that's not the case. Mm -hmm. When you um, treat a patient with assisted suicide, it becomes medical care and medical treatment. And that impacts all of us. We have a profit-driven healthcare system, and one person's decision does impact us. And what really scares me as a caregiver is that we are seeing in states where this is legal, in California and Oregon specifically, we have some cases where patients who have curable cancer, mm -hmm. not even um, terminal cancer mm -hmm. like JJ, their insurance companies are denying them coverage for treatment, which makes them terminal then, and then offering assisted suicide instead. So what would you say to legislators who might be considering assisted suicide legislation? Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to speak with legislators and, you know, we speak with um, legislators who span the political spectrum and we work with group disability rights groups, we work with um, medical professional societies and really the top three things that I always try to point out is that one, doctors make mistakes. Look at JJ, his doctors were so very wrong and, and, and that's not unusual. It's very difficult to pro prognosticate six, six months or more out how much time you have left to live. Mm. Patients outlive their six months um, 
about 20% of the time. Doctors underestimate how much patients are going to live, how long they're going to live. Second is that JJ, having gone through what he went through, we saw that the safeguards in these laws are inadequate. He experienced a period of depression, but it wasn't at the time when he could have requested the medication. You see what happens is there are these supposed safeguards in the laws that when a patient requests these lethal medications, their doctor may refer them out for psychological evaluation, but it's not mandatory. And in reality, in Oregon, it happens about 3% of the time. Last year, it was around 3% of patients, very small amount, wherever evaluated for depression. But even if the patient is evaluated and they're not depressed when they receive the medications, no one's required to follow up with you. You go home with that medication, you have it on your nightstand, and no one's there. But then the last thing I mentioned is the health insurance. And most legislators, when I speak to them and, and our coalition speaks to them, they see the very real danger of this. That, you know, when it comes down to it, will a health insurance company do the right thing or the cheap thing? Finally, Kristen, my last question to you is, what do you think JJ's message would be if he were here today speaking about assisted suicide? The reason I'm here today is that even in his final days, JJ was adamantly opposed to assisted suicide. One of the last things he asked of me was that I would continue sharing our story for him to protect the vulnerable people who are put at risk by this legislation. And I think that that's the most important message that he has is that you, all we can do is one day at a time. Everyone should always have hope, even if it's just hope for that day. And with assisted suicide, you can't look at the individual. This isn't just one situation. You have to look at how it's going to impact everyone. Mm -hmm. Kristen Hansen, thank you for carrying on JJ's legacy and sharing his witness with us today. Thank you, Catherine. To find out more about Kristen's work against assisted suicide, you can go to patientsrightsaction.org. That does it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, but I'd love to hear from you before next week. Email me at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com or like my public page on Facebook so we can keep this pro-life conversation going. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.